Hi, I'm Daniel Foley from the Abundant Life Training Center, and welcome to this training on the beauty of grace. So this training we're about to do, this is a recap of the year of 2020 and the main lessons, the main teachings we've been talking about inside of the Abundant Life Blueprint. Now, the teachings that we're going to go over here in this training today actually come from three different books that I've written over the last year and we're pulling concepts out of those books to combine them into hopefully one message that's hopefully a blessing to you here on the beauty of grace this was the main theme that emerged throughout the year of 2020 for us which was the beauty of grace so let's talk about a beautiful life the bible talks about god wants to give us beauty for ashes god wants to lead us to a beautiful place it says uh in the old testament that god searched out the entire world and he found the promised land for the children of Israel. He says he searched out. He went searching all over the whole world. And he searched out the most glorious, the most beautiful of all the lands in the entire world. God wants to lead our lives to a beautiful place. Not just a healthy place, but healthy and beautiful. Now realize, though, that God takes us on a journey in life. It doesn't happen Immediately think about the the children of Israel going on their journey to the promised land They went through stages and phases on their journey to the most beautiful land in the whole world Now it might be we start off in an unhealthy place. Maybe that's uh, You know our emotions are a mess or our finances relationships our health is a mess. We're in an unhealthy place I think God first wants to take us to a healthy place if you don't feel well the first thing you're worried about is just getting feeling better again feeling healthy again if your relationship is a mess you want to get it to a healthy place. But then there's another level. We're talking about promised land, the most glorious and beautiful of all the lands in the entire world. God wants to take us to a beautiful place, not just healthy, but beautiful and healthy. But God does lead us through these phases, these progressions in life on this journey to the promised land. Now, in our program, The Abundant Life Blueprint, we always talk about the three phases that we go through. First, we talk about the wilderness. And when we're in the wilderness, it's about saying yes to a bigger vision for our lives. It's about saying yes to God's plan and visions for our lives and being willing to move forward with that plan. And then we talk about there's a transition period. We just can't step into it right away. There's a transition period, a preparation period. God tells the children of Israel, when you cross over into the land, it's going to take you more than a year to possess the land because the beasts would become too many. So they begin to transition. We go through, typically we talk about a one-year transition phase where we're getting prepared for what God has called us to do. And then we move into, hopefully, this promised land, the most beautiful, the most glorious of lands that God has prepared for us, that he's searched out just for us. And that's hopefully the place that God has taken us to. But we talk about beauty. Let's talk about what are some characteristics? What makes something beautiful? We think about something beautiful. There would be vibrant, beautiful colors. It would be clean and clear. It would be simple. It would be elegant. For example, if we're talking about a very simple business or a very simple organization that's run beautifully. What would we say? It's very simple. It's not overly complex. Oftentimes, what makes something beautiful is what's not there. A beautiful garden wouldn't be overrun with weeds. Something that's simple and elegant, but at the same time, it's full with nothing missing, nothing, nothing lacking. In the Abundant Life Blueprint, we talk about getting every room in the house, purpose and health and family and finances, order, time, community, emotions, connection with God, spiritual growth, everything working together, everything harmoniously working together for good with nothing missing, nothing lacking, getting everything in our lives to a beautiful place. And hopefully we talk about beauty. One of, the, one of the keys to beauty is being balanced and symmetrical as well. Beauty is also unique. Beauty is rare. It's rare to see beautiful things. I do believe God wants to get us to this healthy and beautiful place. Now, what we need to understand is that for God to take us to this beautiful place, we're supposed to be becoming the beautiful, spotless bride of Christ. But what we need to realize is that the way that this happens, the way this becomes enabled in our lives, we can't do this in our own strength. When God searched out the promised land for the children of Israel, he was taking them to the most beautiful, the most glorious of all the lands in the world. But there was a problem. They could not take that land in their own strength. There were giants in that land, and only, they could only take it through God's strength, his power. And the key to that 
is tapping into God's grace. God's grace is his power. God's grace is his enabling to empower us to do what we cannot do in our own strength. So to take this most beautiful, the most glorious of all lands, we must learn to rest from our works, to stop stressing and striving and worrying and doing all these things. We have to learn to rest from our work and instead to allow God to do his work through us. Even Jesus said, in my own strength, I can do nothing. In my own self, I can do nothing. It's the Father in me that does the work. And so for us to truly step into this beautiful place in life, we must learn to rest from our work and allow God's grace and power enabling us to do what he can do, not what we can do, is the key. Now, in 2 Corinthians 9 and 8, it says God's grace is able to abound so that having all sufficiency in all things and at all times, you can abound to every good work. What does this word abound mean? To abound means to increase greatly. God is able to make all grace abound, to increase greatly. And in the Latin, the word abound has the root, roots coming from the words of wave or surge. I want you to think about this. God's grace, his power is on the inside of you. And it must flow through us out into the world. And it comes out in waves or surges. When we get God's grace abounding in our life, it's like waves of his glory, waves of his love, waves of his power surge through our lives, empowering us to do what we can't do in our own strength. We talk about abound. To abound is to increase greatly. God tells Noah in the book of Genesis, be fruitful, multiply, and increase greatly. In Isaiah 40, verse 12, it says, God gives power to the faint and gives strength to the weak, causing him to multiply and to abound or to increase greatly. So God wants to take us to this place where his grace is abounding. His grace is abounding is what leads to a beautiful life. So how do we get this grace abounding? First, we must understand grace. I went through a time in my life, and I talk about it in my book, The Eighth Date. How in Proverbs 4, I was reading in Proverbs 4 one morning, and it just jumped off the page at me. It says, though it cost you all, though it cost you everything, gain understanding. And I went through a time, some serious struggles in my life, where I was working, getting to this place where I understood. And what was it that I needed to understand? In the book of Colossians, it says that the gospel bears fruit in our lives ever since the day we understood God's grace. Ever since the day we understood God's grace. So what is it that we need to understand about grace? Number one, we need to understand that in Isaiah 61, which is the passage of scripture that Jesus reads from the scroll, he says he came to proclaim freedom, the release from darkness for the prisoners, to be released from darkness. And then in the book of Colossians 1.13, it says we should be giving thanks continually that we've been released from the darkness and transferred into the light. We've been transferred into the kingdom of God's dear son. So the first thing we need to understand, God, when we, the moment we receive Jesus into our lives, we are released from the darkness, we're transferred into God's kingdom. And then it says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we've been seated in heavenly places with Christ. So we've been had a change in position. We've been released from the darkness, we're transferred into light, and now we're seated in heavenly places. We're going to talk about how to apply that. And then in Jeremiah 32, God says, in those days, I'm going to make a new covenant. In what days? In our days. I'm going to make a new covenant with the people that I'm only going to do continually good for them all the time. That's grace, that he's only doing continually good for us all the time. We see a progression in the Bible. We're under the law. God, if people don't perform right, they get the curse. And then they go through a time where God gets angry and he withdraws his presence. And in the book of Samuel, I believe it says, it says the word of the Lord was rare and just God wouldn't talk to him anymore. Now for us individually, we all have a tendency when people do us wrong, when people don't follow the rules the way we think they should, when people aren't behaving the way they should, what do we tend to do? We tend to retaliate at them. We tend to criticize them. Maybe we withdraw our presence. Maybe we avoid them. Maybe we give them the silent treatment. We are supposed to do just like God is doing for us. We're supposed to do continually good for people all the time. No matter what they do to us, no matter what buttons they push in our life, 
we're supposed to do continually good. We all have buttons that people can push that make us want to retaliate, that make us want to withdraw our presence, to avoid people, to give them the silent treatment. But we are to do continually good for others, just like God is doing for us. And that's when we begin to understand grace. And any time that grace is not coming out of us, we're not doing good, we, a button gets pushed and we don't respond with grace, that's our opportunity to repent. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's our chance to repent. That's our chance to turn and get that grace flowing again in our lives. So how does this grace abound? How does this grace flow through us? Like I said, there's three levels of flow when it comes to grace. Number one, it starts on the inside. We have to receive God's grace. He's giving it to us, but we could choose not to receive it. It's a free gift that God is giving to us, but we could choose not to receive the gift. We must receive it from God. He wants to work for our good in every area of life. And then we have to learn to let it flow through us because oftentimes we block the flow of grace through us and we limit what God can do in our lives. And then we've got to continually do good and give grace to other people just like God is doing for us. Let's talk about those three levels. Number one, we have to receive God's grace by faith. We don't have anything other than his word and his promises and what he speaks to us on the inside. We have to receive his grace and we should be receiving. The Bible, Jesus talks about receive the moment that you pray. Believe you receive the moment that you pray. How do we receive God's grace? We can move into gratitude. Start thanking him regularly that he's working for your good. Thank him regularly for, your, for his grace. And then we need to understand righteousness that we are right with God, we have right standing with God, that God wants to work for our good because of Jesus and not because of our own works. And then we receive it through humility. When we understand that this is God's grace empowering me to do what I can't do in my own strength, and I didn't earn it, I simply believed, it leads to a place of humility. Because you're like, I didn't do anything for this. So first we got to receive that with God, nothing is impossible. And he wants to help us in the everyday moments of everyday life. Doing your work, doing your workout, taking care of your kids, in your relationship with your, if you're married, doing the dishes, taking out the trash. His grace is there to help you in everything that you do. And we have to receive that. And then we've got to get that grace flowing through us and out into the world. And the biggest thing is we tend to block the flow of grace. How do we do this? we tend to put the pressure on ourselves. Rather than trusting and resting that God's grace and power are there and readily available to help us and to empower us, we try to put the pressure on ourselves and we try to do everything in our own strength. Rather than waiting for God's timing, we try to do everything in our own strength. We tend to beat ourselves up, condemn ourselves, put the pressure on ourselves to make everything happen. But God wants to teach us to get to this place. The promised land is what? Is a place of rest. He wants to teach us how to get to this place where we trust and we rest. We trust that his power is there. It's available and it can flow through us. And we get out of the way and allow God to work and allow him to do what he wants to do. But we have to learn to trust and to rest. And an amazing thing happens when we rest. When we rest, we take our eyes off of ourselves. And all of a sudden, our presence is increased. We become more aware of God's presence with us in the everyday moments of life. And we become more present ourselves. And we become more and more aware of opportunities to do good and to be a blessing to people in our lives. And to be doing continually good all the time. And I want you to remember this. Presence turns the tables and allows grace to flow. If you get one thing right to get grace flowing, it is presence. If you will just Focus more on God's presence with you in the day, and you get more present. What does it mean to be more present? We're not off in some other world in our mind. We're not think, living in regret over the past or condemnation. We're not worried about an uncertain future. We're here in the present moment doing what we know to do right now with God's help and power, empowering us to do whatever we're doing right this second. Everything we're doing, we can be doing in our own strength, or it can be done through God's power equipping us and empowering us to do everything that we do. And if we will simply get more present, it will lead to miraculous results. Now, like I said, everything we do in this physical world is a 
point of contact. It's a point of trust that is either releasing God's power working in our lives or it's us trying to do things on our own strength. So Oral Roberts used to have a teaching he called the point of contact. A point of contact is we taking spiritual principles, we're combining the mind and imagination, and we're putting something practical or physical that we do with these spiritual and mental and emotional principles. So for example, taking communion is one of the most powerful things we can do in our entire lives. It changes the trajectory of our lives, I do believe. Because what are we doing? We're taking the spiritual principles of Jesus' sacrifice and we're bringing it into the present moment, making, rele making it relevant to our lives right now in this present moment. And when we do that, we imagine God pouring the cup of his wrath onto the body of Jesus. His body was broken. It was smitten. It was crushed. It was pierced. It was bruised. He was wounded for our sins, our iniquities, our transgressions. And now we have the cup of blessing in his blood. That God is working continually for our good because of Jesus. Communion is combining together what? Remembrance in our mind and our imagination, spiritual principles, and something physical that we actually do. We can also begin this process we're going to talk about of writing out prayers will be another point of contact to put something physical to our prayers that we actually do. We can also give what we call a memorial portion, which is just taking a small handful of what you have and giving it to God anytime it looks like you don't have enough. Because in our own strength, we can't do anything. But when we take a memorial portion, this is from the Old Testament, the priests were commanded to take a small handful of the offerings and give it to God. And it, what is it? It's a memorial. It stirs up the memory for us of what? That even though we only have a little bit, God can take the little bit that we have and do the miraculous with it. Like Jesus multiplying the fish and the loaves. We can give memorial portions as a reminder to stir that up in our minds and pair it with something physical that we do. So everything that we do, when I work out, when I pay for my groceries, every interaction that I have with people is all done from a place of trust and rest that God's power and grace are there to help, or it's done in my own strength, trying to figure things out, trying to work and to toil and to manipulate and to try to figure everything out. When I learn to trust and rest and turn it over to God, that's when his grace, that's when his power flows. Now, toward the end of the year, inside the Abundant Life Blueprint, we started to have some conversations about writing what you want. In the book of Esther, in Esther chapter 8, verse 8, the tables have been turned. There was a law written that was going to destroy God's people. And Queen Esther petitions the king, she and her uncle Mordecai petition the king to write a new law that overrides the old law. And the king tells Esther and Mordecai this, you write whatever you want. You write whatever you want. Well, why don't you think about this? Jesus is the table turner. Jesus went into the temple and he turned over the tables. Jesus is the table turner. It used to be the old covenant was in place. You do right, you get blessed. You do wrong, you get cursed. Jesus turned the tables. He brought in a new covenant for us. We talk about the number eight is symbolic of new covenants and new beginnings. Look at this, Esther 8. Eight, Jesus says what? You ask for anything in my name and I will do it. And then he also says, if two or three of you are in agreement, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. And it says that so God would be glorified and that our joy would be full. So we started going through this process of writing out, what do I want in life? I feel like God's telling us, what do you want out of life? And we're going through this process. I'm starting to write out for the week, for the day. All right, what do I want out of the day? What do I want out of this week? And I'm seeing things shift. Things are moving in good directions in many places. But it was kind of tedious to go through this process. And I began to ask God, all right, there's got to be a more simple, a more elegant, a more beautiful way to do this. About how, what do we ask for? If you, if you could ask for anything, what do you want? What do you ask for? What's the right thing to ask for? And then I came across some teaching on the parable in Matthew chapter 20 about the landowner. Jesus says 
The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who had a vineyard and he goes out and he hires workers for the day. And the first worker that he hires comes to an agreement with God in this case. And he said, they come to an agreement that he's going to work for the day for one denarius, which was an increment of money in those times. His pay for the day will be one denarius. Then as the day goes on, the landowner goes out and hires more people. He hires many waves of people throughout the day. And the next groups of people that he hires, it's a different arrangement. He says, you go work for me in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. I'll pay you whatever is right. And so think about this. If you went in for a job interview, and you got the job, and you say, how much does it pay? You say, oh, we're just going to pay you whatever we think is right. That would take an enormous amount of trust in that employer's generosity, their character, their intentions for you. That would take an enormous amount of trust. And sure enough, they got paid the same amount as the guy that worked the entire day, but they didn't work as long. They worked fewer hours, but they got paid the same amount. But then it says the landowner, and so the, the take home message for, there is that we can ask God to do what is right, what is best, what is beautiful, what is glorious in his eyes. Because he is generous, he's kind, he's loving, he's full of grace and truth. But then there was a group that was hired at the very end of the day. It says they only worked one hour. And their arrangement was different than the first group that agreed for a denarius. Their agreement was different than the second groups, the second waves of groups that said they would go work for whatever the landowner thought was right in his eyes. This group was different. The landowner said simply this, go work in my vineyard for the day. Go work in my vineyard. He didn't guarantee them anything. He simply said, go work in my vineyard. And they obeyed and they went. And that group only worked one hour. And they got paid the same as everybody else who worked the entire day. And for, who worked many hours. So think about this. If you're getting paid, let's say in today's wages, 10 or $15 an hour. But you only worked one hour and you got paid for a whole day's worth of wages, let's say eight to 10 hours worth. That's like you're making a hundred and something dollars per hour. Because they simply what? Obeyed. A few chapters later, after that Matthew 20 parable, just a few pages later in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, it's like God had two sons. He tells them both to go work in his vineyard. One says, I'm not going to do it. But then he changes his mind and he goes. The other one says, I'll go. But then he never goes. Jesus says, blessed will we be when we're people who are obedient. And when God comes, he finds us doing what we're supposed to be doing. Imagine you went into a workplace and you're the employer, you're the boss. And you go in and the people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So the highest level, the highest group, I'm talking about the beautiful land, is a place of what? Just simplicity, simple obedience. And so I began to see, hey, wait a minute, we could write asking God to do what is right, what is best, what is pleasant and beautiful in his eyes. Or we could write this, God, I want to be doing what you say I'm supposed to be doing. Because I trust that if I'm doing that, then everything else that I want will take care of itself because you are kind, you are generous, you have amazing intentions for my life. This takes an even higher level of trust. And I think we should ask this. In 1 Timothy, it says that God has called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to God's purpose and grace given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. God wrote a book, I believe, about each one of our lives. Jesus says, it was written about me in your book that I've come to do your will. We're supposed to be imitating Jesus. David says in Psalms 139, all the days of my life were written about in your book. They were ordained for me in your book. So I think the highest level that we can ask for, what should we be writing out? 
one of the most important things I believe is this. God, tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, what I really want is to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing according to your purpose and grace given to me in Christ Jesus before time began. Because we have to align our lives what God wrote in his book for us. He wrote a book about our lives before we were ever born. And our job, our role is to align our lives with his book. Now, one other thing that I think is a, a good thing to write out and ask God to do. We've seen some amazing results come from this in my own life. It says Jesus, Isaiah 53, Jesus was smitten by God. He was struck down. He was crushed. He was pierced. He was bruised. He was wounded. God is taking us into a land that we cannot take in our own strength. There are giants in the land. There are probably giants in every area of life, in your purpose, in your health, in your family, finances, order, time, community, things that you cannot handle in your own strength. And I believe one of the things that we can write out is a prayer asking God to smite our enemies. And it says in the time of Solomon, we can, we can, that he gave them peace and rest on every side. God, smite our enemies, take care of them for us. And one of the biggest keys here, one of the biggest keys I learned in 2020 about everything, We've been released from the darkness. We've been transferred into the light. The greatest spiritual warfare you can ever do is called ignoring. Ignoring the devil, and you focus on the light. You focus on God. You ask him to do it for you instead of you fighting the devil. You ask him to do it for you. And he will take care of them. It says he will make your enemies a footstool for you. But if you try to fight them in your own strength, you can't do it. We can pray and ask God to do it, and he will do it. And so we focus on the light. How do we do that? Continual praise and gratitude. God is with you. He's present with you. He's working for your good in everything that you do. You've been released from the darkness, transferred into the light, transferred into the kingdom of God. The greatest spiritual warfare you can ever do is ignore and focus on God instead and ask him to do it for you. I once heard him tell me this, do you want your bride fighting your battles for you? We're supposed to be the bride of Christ. I don't want my bride fighting my battles for me. I'd rather her bring them to me. We can give those to God and he will do it for us. But this is something we wrote out, a physical prayer, signed it, dated it, Think about when Esther and Mordecai wrote out the law. That was a legal document. Signed, dated. We take communion over the top of it as a symbol, as a reminder. Sealing it in the name of Jesus. Now, we write out. All right, God. I want you to smile my enemies. Give me peace and rest on every side. Today, what I really want is I want to be doing what you wrote about in your book. That's what I want to be doing, because that's where the purpose is. That's where the grace is. That's where the flow is. Because whatever God authored in his book for you, he is obligated to help you walk it out. He's obligated to sustain it, to pay for it, to help you, to enable you, to equip you, to do it. Whatever he authored in your book, he is not He is obligated to sustain. So what do we do? We wake up. I like to write it out the night before. God, tomorrow, because in the Jewish culture, the day starts in the evening. So the night before, it's considered the start of the day. I like to write it out before I go to bed. And when I wake up in the morning, I wake up like a kid on Christmas morning. Tomorrow, I want to be doing what you wrote out in your book, God, according to your purpose and grace given to me in Christ Jesus before time began. And I wake up and you know what we say? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then what do we do? We focus on the light. We start stirring up our gratitude. When we pray that, that hey, tomorrow I want to be doing what you wrote about in your book. We pray that. We believe we receive that the moment we prayed. If we are in true faith about that, because we have to receive it by faith, peace is our indicator. When we are single-minded 
in our beliefs. We're unwavering in our beliefs. We come to a firm decision that God's working for our good. He's got an amazing plan for this day, today, that he already wrote about in my book. When I believe that I've received that and I'm unwavering that, what is my indicator? Peace. Peace is my indicator. And then joy is my indicator of presence because in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. When the, Holy, when the kingdom of God comes, there's what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Peace and joy together are my indicator that creates the environment that releases miracles, that releases the flow of grace in my life. Joy is my indicator that I'm focused on God's presence being with me and I'm staying present in the present moments of my day. Peace is my indicator that I'm in faith. Peace is my indicator. I'm in faith and unwavering. Joy is my indicator that I'm focused on God and being seated in heavenly places with him in his presence all day long in everything I do. When I lose my peace and my joy, that's my indicator. I got to make some adjustments. In my book, The Eighth Day, we talk about staying in your heavenly seat. Everything we do throughout the day is done from seated in heavenly places with Christ or it's done in our own strength. In Isaiah, I believe it's 29, it says, God will give strength to turn the battle at the gate. What is the gate? I believe the gate is our mind and our emotions. Where does Satan attack? In our mind and emotions. He'll give you strength to turn it when you're tempted to doubt, when you're tempted to lose your peace, when you're tempted to lose your joy, when you're discouraged, frustrated, bitter. Turn the battle at the gate. You can use communion as a way to turn that battle at the gate, to get your mind fixed back on God. And then we show up, we wake up like a kid on Christmas morning, full of peace, full of joy, full of the confident expectation of good. But sometimes the things we're really wanting, the things we're really believing for, sometimes we have to wait a little while. And that's where we move into hope. Who hopes for what they haven't yet seen, the Bible tells us. Hope is, the dictionary definition of hope, is the feeling of trust. The feeling of trust. When we're trusting and resting in Christ, we have hope. And what is hope? The Amplified Bible, the definition of hope, is the confident expectation of good. Confident expectation of good. We wake up every day with expectation like a kid on Christmas because our confidence is not in ourselves. This is not confidence in ourselves that we can figure it out, that we can make it happen, that we can do it. This is the least of that. This is confidence in God, that he wants to help you, that he's able to help you, that he's going to help you. Confident expectation of good. And I'm gonna walk out that plan I like to say it this way, confidence is the place where all doubt is removed. Confidence is the place where all doubt is removed. It's a place of knowing. Not only do we get to this place of understanding that God's grace is working for our good, we get to this place of knowing and all the doubt is removed because our confidence is in God, not in ourselves, not in other people. Our confidence is in God. And we can wait full of confident expectation. We wake up every morning like a kid on Christmas morning, excited for the day, full of hope, full of confidence, full of peace, full of joy, full of presence. And that's how we go about our day. And then whatever we know to do, how do we know what to do? Whatever you know you're supposed to be doing, you start taking action on those things. Any opportunities that you have to do good, Take those opportunities, begin to step into those and walk those things out. God will send you opportunities your way every single day. He'll send you ideas. He'll send you concepts. He'll send you things to be working on. He'll send you people across your path. One of the beautiful things about this is every day there can be amazing surprises waiting for you in your day. Now, I was once in this year, we're doing homeschool because we've got the kids at home with school this year in 2020. And I'm doing a science experiment with my daughter where we're creating a temporary magnet. We're turning a nail into a magnet. How do we do that? We take another magnet and we slide it across 
the surface of the nail. And what happens is this, the molecules in the nail are all facing different directions. But every time I slide that nail or the magnet across the nail, it begins to align all the molecules in the direction that I'm sliding the magnet. And so I, you do that 30, 40 times. You start aligning, 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 aligning. And finally, when all of the molecules in the nail are all facing the same direction, it turns the nail into a temporary magnet. And you can hold it over the top of a pin or a paper clip and it will pick it up. But it is a temporary magnet because as soon as you shake it, you heat it, you hit it, you put some pressure on it, what happens? The molecules revert back to their old pattern. They lose their alignment and the magnetism is lost. What's well, an interesting thing, in science it's proven anytime there's electrical current, anytime there's flow happening, it creates a magnetic field. So when grace begins to flow, when grace begins to flow, it begins to turn your physical body into a magnet and it's almost like you're pulling the things that you're wanting and desiring in life into your life. How do we create this temporary magnet? We show up with peace. We show up with joy. We show up with hope. We show up with a confident expectation of good. That should be our emotional state. My wife was showing me something recently. It's talking about how the brain is the only place in the body that actually responds to magnets. They can see physical changes happening in your body due to magnets being around it. What is the message there? We can magnetize our lives by the emotional states and the mindsets and what we're meditating on, what we're thinking about. We're supposed to be in a continual state of peace, joy, confidence, confident expectation of good. But what happens? Sometimes, we get knocked out of alignment. Life puts, how do we demagnetize it? We shake it, we put pressure on it, we heat it. Sometimes life puts pressure on us. It could be financial pressure, relationship issues, a health issue. Someone says something and slights you. You get offended. You get in an argument with your spouse or your kids or a family member. And it doesn't take long. One little thing knocks you out of alignment and it ruins your whole day. The day that the Lord had made you lost that whole day because one little bad thing happened and it steals away your entire day. And so I believe if we'll get to this place where we start to continually have days of peace, joy, hope, confidence, confident expectation of good, confidence in God, and that's our state. Like the temporary magnet though, we had to keep sliding it, I had to keep aligning, 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 aligning. When it happens enough times, it turns us into that temporary magnet. And whenever we get knocked out of alignment, what do we need to do? We need to repent. What does repent mean? It means to turn. It means I got to turn it back as quickly as possible. You lose your peace. You lose your joy. You get bitter. You get frustrated. You get uh, worried. You get stressed. You get sad. You got to turn it back as quickly as possible. Sometimes our expectations we'll get frustrated. We're expecting this is the day the Lord has made and it doesn't quite go according to our plan. What we thought was best and our expectations get frustrated. What do we do? We repent, number one, get turned back. And what are we supposed to do? We bring that to God. You bring your frustrated expectations to God because more than likely what happened? You maybe got impatient or you're trying to make something happen in your own strength rather than resting and trusting that God's going to make it happen in his perfect timing. Think about trust and hope. What does it take? It takes trusting in God's timing. They haven't seen it yet, God. Well, just wait, just rest. It will happen. We can bring our frustrated expectations to him and say, hey, I'm bringing this to you because I'm frustrated about this. Teach me. Jesus says, bring, bring me your issues, and I'll give you rest. Learn of me because I'm gentle and I will teach you. We can bring those to him. And he will teach us how to create that back, get back into alignment as quickly as possible. But we can become, start to become very self-aware. When I get knocked out of this mental state, I can turn it back as quickly as possible. Now, in Numbers chapter 12, there is the story of Moses and Aaron, his brother, and sister Miriam. 
God had positioned Moses in charge of the people. But Moses and or Aaron and Miriam begin to rebel against Moses. They say, Moses isn't the only one that hears from God. God works through us as well. And they begin to rebel against Moses. And what happens? God gets angry because they're out of the position that he has for them. They're not doing what he's called them to do. He's, they're not doing what God wrote about in their book. They're trying to take away what God wrote about in Moses' book. And they're rebelling against authority in their lives. And God gets angry about this. And God inflicts Miriam with leprosy. And Moses prays for her and asks God to heal her. And God says, if her father had spit in her face, wouldn't she have to go outside of the camp for seven days? In those days, in the time of the law in the Old Testament, if you got spit on, you were considered unclean and you had to go outside of the camp for seven days. If you're leprous, you had to go outside of the camp. Well, after her seven days are over, think about this. It says that she was disgraced. The opposite of grace. She got knocked out of alignment. And what did she experience? She experienced disgrace. When we're in the flow of grace, we are protected. We're in the flow. God's working everything for our good. But we can get knocked out of that. Pride, all kinds of things can knock us out. She got knocked out. But when she returned back to the camp, here's what it says. A very simple little thing at the end of that chapter. It says, when Miriam returned, that the people left Hazaroth, a place called Hazaroth, and they settled in the desert of Paran. Hazaroth means a hedged in thorny place. Hazaroth means the hedged in thorny place. And the desert of Paran means a beautiful, glorious place. So what's the message there? When we get knocked out of alignment, if we will turn and get back, it will lead us from where? A hedged in thorny place to a beautiful, glorious place, the land that God has for us. Think about this. Jesus, it says, wore a crown of thorns so that God could give us a beautiful crown of glory. God wants to take us from a thorny place to a beautiful place. Ezekiel 28, 24, God says, No more a briar to prick or a thorn to hurt them among all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. So Moses was treated with contempt by Aaron and Miriam. But when it got righted, that thorn was removed and they went moved to a beautiful, glorious place. Isaiah 61, God says, I want to give you a double portion for any contempt or shame or disgrace that you've suffered. So God wants to lead us to this beautiful place, a place of double portion. Now, Jesus also talked about thorns in the parable of the sower. One of the examples Jesus gives, it says, when a seed is planted, weeds and thorns can choke out the seed, making it unfruitful, allowing God's seed not to produce fruit and lead us to this beautiful place in life. And he said, the, we the weeds and thorns are this, the worries of life and the deceitfulness of riches. When we get focused on taking care of ourselves and we get worried about the things of life, rather than resting and trusting in God, it puts us in a hedged in thorny place that we cannot get out of in our own strength. It takes God to release us into that land, the most beautiful of all lands that he searched out for us. It will lead us, if we will turn and we will get back and get back in alignment, peace, joy, hope, confident expectation of good, putting our hope and our trust in God's unfailing love for us, as it says in the book of Psalms. It will lead us to a beautiful place. Now, in the promised land, God tells the people, this is not going to be like the land you lived in before. This is going to be a land of hills and valleys. A land of hills and valleys. It means there will be ups and downs. But when we get to this place, this beautiful place, those valleys are actually going to be one of the things that accelerate our lives and help to produce results even faster. There's an author called Nassim Talib, 
has a book called Anti-Fragile. He says things that are fragile, when adversity or randomness in the world happens, they break. They get knocked out of alignment and they break. But things that are anti-fragile, when randomness or adversity or things you weren't expecting happen, they get better. If we will get to this place where if we ever get knocked out of alignment, we will turn and we will repent and we will change and we will get back into alignment, it will lead us to this place where not only do we go to a beautiful place, that whenever random, adverse, or whatever things happen, we will only benefit from them. We will only gain from them. Think about this. If you're riding a bike on a stretch of land that has ups and downs, and you got a big hill to go up to climb the mountain, having a downhill before the big hill is actually good. Having a valley before it is actually good because you build up speed going down that hill. And when you accelerate back up the hill, it makes it easier to get up the next mountain. God wants to lead us to this beautiful place. And part of it is getting to this place that no matter what's going on around us, we stay consistent. We stay full of peace. We stay full of joy, hope, confident expectation of good. And we move to this place that we are anti-fragile. When the pressures of life come, we only benefit from them. We only get better. And that's the place I believe God wants to get our life to. Now, in October of this year, through some seeking, the word that kind of came through is that a new era has begun. A new era has begun in the world. We're in a crazy time in the world right now, finishing up the year of 2020 with coronavirus and all kinds of things going on. And God is saying a new era has begun. I, I got this word and I've seen many other people have said the same word. A new era has, become, has begun, a new point in time. I believe God is leading his body, his church into a new era, a new phase in the world where we have to learn to operate in this grace. And God is progressive. I believe God wants to do more this year than he did last year. He wants to do new and greater things this year than he did last year. I believe he designed every single year in our lives to lead to breakthrough. And so the question is, we did a teaching recently, a new year, a new name. God wrote a book about your life. What is the title of the chapter for this year? Maybe you're watching this as we're getting ready to start 2021 or some other time. What is the chapter of this year going to be called? Think about this. God had to often change names in the Bible. Abram had to become Abraham. Sarai had to become Sarah. Saul had to become Paul. Simon had to become Peter. Adam's job in the Garden of Eden was to name things. What's the name of this chapter of your life? And we name it first and then we walk it out, and it becomes that thing that we named it. We write it out first. What's the chapter of your book titled for this year? What does God want to do this year? What's the thing, if we're being that simple level of obedience that God wrote about that we're supposed to be doing this year? What is that thing? Because if we're doing that thing, that's where all of the benefits lie. Now, for me personally, the word that's come through for me is the year of greatness. Increasing greatly, the year of greatness. We've been talking a lot about inside of the Abundant Life Blueprint and my books, The Eighth Date and The Miracle Year. We've been talking about our standard, our goal in life is grace. We're operating, we're functioning in grace. And one of the byproducts of that is that we are making other people great. Our standard or target, how do we know if our life is really on track? is we're making other people great. That's our standard in life. Now in the Bible, Jesus gives us some keys to greatness. He says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you must have childlike faith and humility. So what do I think that is? Saying yes to a bigger vision, that with God, nothing is impossible. God, you wrote this book about my life, and I'm going to say yes to that, and I'm going to align my life with what you wrote about in your book. And then we must understand gentleness. In Psalms 1835, I believe it is, David says, God's right hand supported me and his gentleness made me great. 
God's right hand supported me and his gentleness made me great. Right now, as I'm recording this, we're getting ready to start a new year. And people are going to go on all kinds of crazy New Year's resolutions where they take the opposite of this. They're going to take a very not gentle approach to their health, to their fitness, to their nutrition, to whatever goals they set. They're going to go crazy at it. We've got to understand that God is going to be gentle with us. He's going to give us grace and gentleness, guiding us along this path. And then we must learn to take that gentleness and apply a more gentle approach in our lives so that we set ourselves up to be consistent and build momentum over time. And then Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you need to practice the commandments and you need to teach them. You need to practice and teach. At a certain point, the only way for you to continue to grow is to begin to teach other people. And so it's saying yes to a vision. It's implementing gentleness. It's beginning to practice the standard of grace and beginning to walk that out in our lives and to walk out the things that we know we're supposed to be doing, that simple obedience. What do I know I'm supposed to be doing? And to be walking that out and then to beginning to teach other people how to do the same. We're supposed to be fruitful and to multiply. So we're supposed to be fruitful, supposed to be multiply, and then we're supposed to what? We're supposed to increase greatly. Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you need to become the servant of many. Not one or two, but the servant of many. You need to increase greatly. You need to be fruitful. You need to multiply. You need to increase greatly. You need to abound through this grace abounding to you. I think the way we get to this beautiful place, we've got to become the servant of many. And I think... In this year of greatness, my goal inside of the Abundant Life Blueprint is to begin to do this for our members and to help them along with this process. I don't have it all figured out. It's going to take God's grace to do it as well. Now, if you would like to go deeper into all this, we would love to have you join us inside of the Abundant Life Blueprint. One of the first things we're going to do, we're going to go through a program called the Miracle Year. And... The goal in the miracle year is to get clear on what God wrote in your book. Get clear. What did God write about in your book? What is the direction? What is the plan he has for your life for this year? What is that chapter of your book going to be called for this year? What's the direction we're supposed to be moving over the next year? And then we're going to be talking about helping you implement over that next year. Implementing with gentleness and consistency and practically walking out what you know to do. And allowing God's grace to begin to empower you in all of those things. And then we got to begin to get you multiplying and teaching it to other people and becoming the servant of many. That's the path that we're after. To lead us to where? This beautiful, this glorious place that we can only take by God's grace. So if you're interested in joining us, you can go to the Abundant Life Training Center dot com to check out more about the abundant life blueprint